This presentation was first made by Gorka Santa Maria at Hexagon Live in June 2016. Due to positive feedback, we have decided to make this video, showing what was presented at Hexagon Live. This video is 40 minutes long, so grab yourself a cup of coffee and take your time to watch. It is well worth it. In this video, we will go through each of the steps in the classic surveying workflow, from the initial capture of reality to the final as-built check in reporting. It is divided into six stages. The initial measuring of the reality or topographic survey, the tidying of the data, the pre-design phase, typically involving the import of data to the office software and the first steps, then the design phase, which will be done by the civil engineers, ending with the design being transferred back to the field, the stakeout and as-built check during construction phase, and the final reporting of the results. The aim of this video is to combine classic and modern methodologies in a unique workflow, showing the advantages of following good practices to make the most out of the data in each of the stages. The first step in the workflow is the initial capture of reality, often called the initial topographic survey. To do this, we have used Leica Captivate field software and two different sensors, an MS-60 multi-station and a GS-16 GNSS sensor. A first job called HBG North was measured with the MS-60 multi-station in a local temporary coordinate system based at 1000-1000. Let's have a look into what it contains. It consists of seven stations covering the survey area. We set up the instrument at station number one and perform the following actions. Measure a backside foreside set to the previous and next stations. Measure several side shots with a variety of feature codes. Scan the adjacent building. Capture some images from the onboard camera. We then move to station number two, where we measure again the backside foresight set to the previous and next station, measure additional side shots creating line work, scan the adjacent building from a different perspective, capture further images from the onboard camera. We repeat the process at each of the stations until the survey is complete. Now let's have a look at which functionalities we have used in Leica Captivate. First we have used onboard feature coding with the following features. Creation of different line work geometries, such as three-point arcs, splines and closed lines. Reversing a line to append new points in the opposite direction. multi-coding to create multiple features in a single shot, and also cross-section surveying using the tool the zigzag to measure alternate lines. Additionally, the tool Measure Foresight has been used to measure the backside foresight sets. This tool allows a certain number of sets to be measured according to a known sequence such as backside, foresight, foresight, backside. These backside, foresight sets do not necessarily have to be part of a traverse, but could also generate different legs on it. It is a flexible tool that can be invoked at any moment, and the results can later be adjusted in the office if needed. Finally, we have also used the scanning app to measure point clouds. In the scan definition, we have defined the scan area and also taken panoramic images.
we have to find the resolution and speed as well as set some filters to remove some of the noise collected in the field. Once scanned, the 3D viewer shows the scanned point cloud in true colour, which is taken from the panoramic image. There is a second job called HBG Topo that was measured using the GS16 GNSS sensor. Two of the stations, 1 and 5, were measured with a longer occupation to obtain accurate positions. These will later be used for adjusting the whole survey to fit to the final project coordinate system. In addition, some RTK points were measured in the areas not measured with the multi-station. The second step of the workflow takes place in Infinity, the office software where we will tidy the field data we just collected. First we create a new project and assign it the correct project coordinate system. Once the project has been created, we import the multi-station data. Remember this data was measured in temporary local coordinates, therefore it is still not in the project coordinate system. As we can see, all the information of points, line work and scans has been imported into the project. To better see the data, we hide the observations layer and now we zoom into the data. Here is all the line work as it was collected in the field. And here we can see some of the scans. In this case, this corresponds to several railway tracks that we could not access in the field for safety reasons. But since we have it scanned, we can easily trace on it and create the features by simply creating a new line, snapping to the points that define the railway. In the same way, we can also clean the point cloud, like we will do with this building, where there are some points that were measured through windows. To do so, we define a window as we press the shift button on the keyboard and this will select all the points contained within it from the current point of view, like we do with this building. Pressing delete, the selected points are removed from the point cloud, which now looks much cleaner. Now let's start with the processing. First we will import the two stations measured with the GS16. In this case, the actual coordinates are imported from a text file using a predefined template, but it could also be the raw files from the GNSS sensors that we could have processed within the project. Since we have imported them in the project coordinate system, with coordinates around 500,000 and 700,000, they will be drawn in the map far away from the multi-station data, which has local coordinates of 1,000 and 1,000. So let's move this multi-station data to the correct location. To do so, we will select the data to move and use the command shift, rotate and scale. First, we choose the method common points and next we will indicate which point relates to which. In this case, we are linking the multi-station data in the local coordinate system in the left column to the matching GNSS measured control points in the project coordinate system in the right column. This will show some residuals, and if these are acceptable, the calculation parameters are shown. By accepting these results, the shift rotation and scale calculation is performed, showing a comprehensive report that can be saved. As you can now see, the whole survey has been moved rotated and scaled to fit the project coordinate system. As said before, 
The backside foresight sets were calculated in the field, but they have not yet been adjusted to each other. Since what we did in the field was actually a Travis-like network, we can easily adjust these coordinates. To do so, we go to the Processing tab and we run the Traverse routine. This is again a wizard type assisted menu that will guide us through the different steps. Firstly, if we select station number one as the starting point and simply add the dataset, Infinity automatically works out the right Traverse sequence as measured in the field. In the next step, we define the processing rule and can set different tolerances. Here we can see an error affecting the height of station 6 that we can distribute along the traverse. Once any errors are distributed and the tolerances are acceptable, the coordinates of the stations in the traverse are adjusted. All the data that was measured from each station is also updated accordingly. Imagine when back in the office we discover we have forgotten to measure the detail of something. Instead of returning to the field, we can calculate any missing points from pairs of images that have been taken from two different setup positions. First, we create a new image group and then browse through the images. We identify the two images that include the common points to be calculated and add them to the image group. Now we select new point and a stereographic sort of layout is displayed with both images. We zoom into the first image and tap on the precise location of the point. Now we zoom into the second image and tap on the same point. If the point can be calculated, the resulting coordinates are displayed. We can give the new point a name and create it. As we can now see in the 3D map, the calculated point appears to be in the correct place, so everything is fine and no site revisit is needed. Next, we can import the areas of data that were measured by GNSS. By doing so, we now have a complete survey with all the data correctly fitting together. So now it is time to export the data in a format that can be understood by our civil design packages, in this case Land XML. First we will create a dataset to be sent to Autodesk Civil 3D. To do this we will use a style sheet that creates Land XML data in a way that Civil 3D expects it. We will create a second dataset using a style sheet. In this case, this creates the data exactly as Bentley Inroads expects it. The third step in the workflow consists of bringing the data into the design software package. As mentioned before, we will bring this dataset into two of the most well known civil packages Autodesk Civil 3D and Bentley Inroads. In Bentley Inroads, the first thing when we open the project is to assign the feature definition file, which in this case has an XIN extension. The feature definition file should be aligned with the code list used in the field, and if this is the case, we'll automatically draw the right symbols and scale them depending on the code of the points. The line work will be drawn with the correct color and style and automatically create a triangulation where the point code indicates and where the line work should be a break line. This XIN file has been previously created using the Inroad Style Manager. Now we go to the Project Explorer. We create a new field book and we load the land XML file.
automatically all of the point and lines have been read and drawn. We can also see that the triangulation or surface has been created. If we hide the triangles, we can actually see the line work as it was measured in the field and has properly been realized. In Autodesk Civil 3D, the first thing to set is the figure prefix database. If the prefixes in this list are aligned with our field code list, all resulting line work will be drawn with the correct colour and style and will be assigned to the correct layer. We can now import the field data. To do so, we open the survey database and import the survey data. First, we need to define the database settings, such as units and precision, and then we are ready to browse the landing XML file we have just output from Infinity. Finally, in the import options, we indicate which objects to insert into the drawing, and most importantly, we set not to process line work during import, because that was already done in the field. By doing so, the drawing in Civil 3D looks the same as we saw before in Infinity, with individual measurements resulting in survey points and line work representing the linear features, so the interchange of data has worked smoothly. If we were interested in also bringing in the point clouds, the best way is to use Leica Multiworks plugin. Multiworks gives the ability to browse an XML file that includes the scan data links and import it into the project, where we can use some of the regular CAD commands on the point cloud, as well as some special multi-works commands for enhanced functionality. Returning back to our survey database, the next step is to create the surface resulting from this data. To do so, we create a new surface and give it a name and display the properties. First, we need to add the points to it. In this case, all of the points. We now have a triangulation However, the break lines have not yet been realized correctly. To do so, we have to add the break lines separately. In this case, we simply select all the lines in the survey database, and Civil 3D will update the triangulation accordingly. We have measured our data in the field with Leica Captivate, consolidated and refined the data with Leica Infinity, and sent it to our Civil Design software where we have obtained the surface of the natural terrain. Once we have this surface, the design phase comes into place. In this case, we have chosen the design of a road corridor model. This process normally takes place in each of the civil design packages, but we will not explain it in this session. However, we will take the final design done in each package and continue with the survey workflow by sending it back into the field to start with a construction phase. The road has been designed in Bentley inroads. In this case, since we have used Select Series 4, the design has been done with the Open Roads technology and the corresponding tasks for corridor modeling. However, in this video, we will make an intermediate conversion of the data to the traditional inroads formats ALG and DTM, so that this process is equally valid for users of older inroads versions. First, we open the traditional inroads dialog and we create a new geometry. Then we use the task menu command export to native, so that the center line of the road created within open roads is transferred to the geometry block in the inroads dialog. 
from here, we can save it as an ALG file. So we have now the center line. Now let's look at the rest of the features defining the corridor. We go back to the task menu and within the terrain model block, we select the option to create from elements. Here we will create a digital terrain model, but each of the feature lines is created as a break line while keeping its name. In this case, we open a second window to better select in 3D and we select each of the features that we want to be part of the road model, such as edges of the road, top of curbs, etc. This generates a terrain model that we will save in a DTM format. Now we go back to the inroads dialog and open the terrain model file we just created, which is realized under the Surfaces tab. It is now time to export the file. To do so, in the File menu of Inroads, we select the option Land XML Translator. We first export a Land XML file that contains the features from the Surface file. And we export a second Land XML file that contains the center line from the geometry file. We are now done with Bentley inroads and will bring the data back into the field. To do so, the next step is to use the Design to Field application. This is a standalone application, part of the Leica Infinity package, which deals with the design data preparation. In this case, what we will import is Bentley Land XML data, split into one file for the horizontal and vertical alignment, the one that we exported from the ALG file, and another file for the cross sections, the one we exported from the feature lines in the DTM file. Once the error checks have been passed, Design to Field shows the road model and if everything is fine, we can export it to a Leica database. As a last step in this process, let's see how to send the data to the field over the internet. To do so, we launch the Leica Exchange Office application and enter our user account details. It couldn't be easier than simply selecting the file and dragging and dropping to the destination user account. Now if we go back to Captivate, we simply start Leica Exchange, enter the user account details and log in, where we see the job is waiting for us. We tell Captivate to get the data And once the job has been received, we quickly check that the row design is as expected. We have also created a road corridor model in Autodesk Civil 3D. Here we have two options to export it. The first option is using Leica Exchange plugin. This plugin is available in versions 2016 and older. Once installed, it can be found in the toolbox, and in this case, we would use it to export data to job. We select the type of job, in this case, a road geometry, and give a name to the resulting database.
We select the data we want to export and that is all. A database file is ready. The second option is using Leica Infrastructure Link plugin, which is available also in version 2017. Once installed, it can be found in the ribbon and it is a two-step process. The first step is to read civil data. This lists all civil objects contained in the drawing and in this case we only select the corridor. The second step is exporting to a hexml file which can be imported back into Captivate. From this point onwards we can use Leica Exchange for the transfer to the field exactly as we did with the previous example. We now have our road design data in Leica Captivate and the construction process of the road starts. The model is already assigned as the road design, so now we select the job where we will store the measurements and start the stake road application. Within stake road we can perform stake out activities such as staking out one of the lines that define the road model. In this case we will stake out the center line. If we don't select any chainage, only the offset and height information will be displayed. As we approach the selected line, the differences become smaller, also reflected in the 3D viewer. It is possible to use any of the different views, such as the cross section view, plan view or the stakeout view and select the one that best suits each scenario. Once we get close to the center line and the differences fall below the defined quality control threshold, the arrows are displayed in green. We place the peg in the ground and we store the point. If we define stake chainage, Captivate will also guide us to a specific chainage along the center line. Therefore, the differences along the line will also be displayed along with an additional arrow. We want to make sure the chainage, offset and height are staked out to an acceptable tolerance. If we try to store the point and the quality control tolerances are not met, a warning message pops up. It is also possible to set an offset to the line. For example, in case we want to place stake pegs in a safety zone away from machines. In this case, the difference values will relate to the offset stake point. Another common task is determining the catch point of a slope, where the design slope meets the natural terrain. We will see this with a manual slope method. We first select the hinge line, in this case, end of corridor left, and we define the slope ratio and direction. At this point, we can also use advanced stakeout methods, used for tasks such as staking out batter rails. We can also offset the hinge line in case we want to leave a safety zone. When we proceed to stakeout, the catch point is calculated based on the intersection of the slope with the real terrain, abstracted from the currently measured elevation. When the catch point is determined within the defined quality control tolerances, the arrows appear in green and we can store the points and move to the next chainage. A third common task is simply checking the height of the ground or road surface. To do so, we can use the layer method. Using this method, the currently measured position is compared to the selected road design layer and the resulting difference in height is displayed. This is typically used in the latest stage of the construction. As it can be seen in the map, the previously staked points are displayed with a different icon in the form of a stakeout peg. We are now finished with the upper layer of the road, so it is time to check the as-built. The first step we will do is to scan the surface of the road into a new job. Therefore, we have the as-built data in the form of a point cloud. 
By using the Inspect Surfaces app, we can compare this point cloud against the design data. This is the same design that we created in Bentley Inroads and we use for stakeout during construction. So we select the design as reference surface and the scans as objects to compare. Now we define the color scale. This scale defines a kind of heat map of deviations of the as-built against the design, so that we can, for example, color points that are out of tolerance above design in dark red, and points out of tolerance below design in dark blue, with a color gradient in between. Inspect Surfaces now calculates and draws the map according to the color scale, so that each point in the point cloud is coloured according to its distance to the design surface. When we identify an area with a deviation that we want to work on, we can simply tap on the area of interest and say turn to point. The instrument will then automatically turn and point using the red laser allowing us to easily identify where the problem is in the field and enabling work to be quickly carried out. The final stage in the workflow is reporting the work that has been done. There are different report types that can be produced. If we continue with the as-built check, Inspect Surfaces has several options on the tools menu. One is a statistical report to see some relevant data at a glance. To produce an actual report, the tool needs to use a style sheet. The report would then not only show some statistical data, but could also show some graphical charts, the images we captured, and an analytical report of each of the points in the point cloud, including the change in offsets, coordinates, distance to surface, with the assigned colour from the scale, etc. If we go back to our stakeout job, we can also output the stakeout information in either a text report or a rich HTML report. To do so, we tap on the export options within the job. First, we will export the text report using a format file. Then we export the same job using the appropriate style sheet. Now let's have a look into the reports. The text report includes the analytical values on each of the variables as defined in the format file. Of course, different format files would produce different reports. The HTML report shows the same analytical values in a much nicer format with logos and colours, and can additionally also produce charts, histograms and other visual forms of report. In summary, the combination of using different field techniques with using the right procedures in each of the stages makes the workflow more efficient and helps produce better deliverables. It is always worth keeping in mind that workflows are not static, as they often get reshaped with improvements in measurement technology, computing power, new ideas and new techniques, which provide new opportunities and challenges. Thanks for watching.